Now, this all started because we've been uh, hosting uh, students from Mizzou for the last year or so uh, who come over and work with us uh, in three-month placements and um, have a great time supporting us on our, our programming uh, and helping us with the channel. So, um, given the opportunity to come back uh, and visit, it's, uh, it's a real thrill. Um, so my talk today is going to be um, a bit about how we work at Media Trust uh, and we bring together um, non-profits and charities with the skills and expertise of the creative industries in the UK uh, to make a difference, to make a change, to drive social impact. Um, and I'll just start with, with an example and then um, just kind of go through um, the different uh, areas we work in. So. Um, we research our audience uh, for the TV channel. Um, we, we ask them the difference the channel's making. So I'll start with Sylvia. Now, Sylvia uh, is a lady who lives in uh, Warrington, just outside Manchester uh, in England. And she's had a tough time of it the last couple of years. She's been unemployed and housebound. She's got mobility issues. Um, but she was watching a TV show on the channel, uh, a show that was made for autistic kids um, by, a, by a young mum uh, who's got an autistic son and felt that there were no TV shows for, for autistic um, kids. So that turned the light on in her, and it's um, a, a strange spark, but we'll, we'll go back to Sylvia later on and see, see how her life has changed from just being inspired by the channel. So Media Trust, we are um, the UK's leading communications charity, um, and our whole ethos is using the power of media to change lives. Uh, and we do this by harnessing the skills, expertise, and resources of um, the charity world, uh, the media world, um, to support uh, charities. Now, why do we do this? Now, we know there's a clear need uh, across the UK. There's about 160 odd thousand nonprofits and charities. There's about half a million community groups, uh, and they are struggling. They're under fire in the media, who are vilifying uh, a lot of the bigger charities. Um, a, m the vast majority of nonprofits are very small, with, with low turnover and no marketing or communications staff, uh, and they don't don't know where to begin, a lot of them. They don't have connections with the media, they don't have uh, connections with uh, the local press, um, and they need support. Uh, and that's the, the thing, uh, it's an increasing need. We get, we, we're being told that again and again. So we're very lucky we have um, over 40 corporate partners from across uh, the creative sector, uh, from broadcasters through to print groups, journalism groups, uh, through to advertisers and digital groups. And really, over the last five years or so, we've seen a real rise um, in the uh, number of digital platforms that have been joining us. Google joined us five years ago. Their president for EMEA is our, one of our trustees. Uh, and then last year, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and Yahoo joined us. Um, and along with this, we've been building out uh, some of the major print groups as well, the press groups such as Telegraph, Evening Standard, um, and ZMGT, who run uh, some of the biggest uh, newspapers in the UK. Uh, and why do they want to get involved with us? Well, they are keen for their staff to engage with local community issues, community matters. Uh, there's a real movement towards um, skilled volunteering, which is uh, less kind of going in and helping paint walls, but more about providing skills uh, and mentoring that can, can deliver ongoing benefit uh, to the nonprofits they're working with. Um, and their staff are increasingly wanting to work for, for organizations that can make a difference. You know, there's a, a social mission more, in, you know, more implicit and explicit within um, creative outlets. Uh, and then kind of on, on the more macro scale, the, the, the UK's creative industries are thriving. It's the second biggest driver of our economy. It employs over a million people and it's growing at two to three times faster in terms of delivering um, uh, profit back into, into UK PLC. So it's, it's a thriving world um, who are growing and, and wanting to help more. So really in terms of collaboration, we, we bring together two or three different groups. We're always working with charities and non-profits to deliver value to them and uh, find creative ways for them to, to get their stories across and have their voices heard. We work with the media um, to create initiatives, partnerships, use their capacity and resources so that they can uh, address their audiences more effectively and make sure they're more representative. And then we have impact. So that really is, you know, the outcome of all of this is we want to demonstrate we're making a change. Uh, and this is where we go back to our funders. So we have a lot of foundations uh, and grant funders who want us to, to be able to demonstrate the difference their investment in our programs uh, is making. So the bit I look after is Community Channel. We're a TV uh, channel. Uh, we broadcast into all UK homes uh, across four platforms. We've been going for 15 years. Uh, and last year we had over 10 million unique viewers. We have a, a loyal audience base of about a million a month. Uh, and our, viewing, uh, our viewers are very kind of mid-market. They're just people across the UK living in towns, cities, suburbs, who are just very community-minded, very engaged, uh, and love the fact that we can reflect real life and real stories back at them. Uh, 
We started as a two hour a day channel, we're now 24 hours a day, and we largely focus on what you could call human interest stories. So a lot of uh, factual documentary and factual entertainment, not much in terms of uh, dramas and comedies or, or live sports and things like that. Uh, so what do we show? So here are some examples of recent series. We work with a very small charity that records uh, life stories of people with dementia, so they can uh, you know, revisit their, their personal biographies and also acts as a support for their families and their carers. Uh, this guy is Derek, he's 92 years old and was a fighter pilot in World War II and founded the UK Gliding School. Uh, and he's great, but he just cannot remember day-to-day -day things, so it's a real support for his family that they can go back and watch this DVD of his life story. And we filmed the kind of process behind that. We did the Who Do You Think You Are uh, version of that with uh, all, the, all the background research uh, and the young kind of production team who are, who are making those films happen. We have a biking adventure show uh, where uh, these two guys get on bikes and biked all around the UK in support of the Children's Air Ambulance and met various celebs on the way. Um, launching in London with the kind of cast of Quadrophenia and then meeting up various uh, other folk on their way around. Uh, that's in Scotland. We have a show promoting getting involved in your local passions and hobbies. So this is a, um, I don't know if you have this over here, like a come dine with me or four in a bed type thing where four super fans test out their passions against each other um, and we use that to promote the arts. We also have um, a craft series where our two presenters are creating lots of upcycled and crafty related stuff and then we link that into local craft and arts charities. Um, one of our major projects is called Do Something Brilliant, and we've been running this the last three years right across the UK, training charity groups and communities, giving them the tools they need to film themselves, create their own press releases, their own digital campaigns, uh, and then we also create a load of programming around that. And we've got trainers in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England, and we've trained around 500 organisations, um, distributed the news of over 1,000 organisations, and overall supported about 2,500 organizations through that. Uh, it includes a regular TV show called Do Something Brilliant. Uh, this is Amanda who presents the Welsh version. Uh, we've filmed about 200 organizations through this uh, and hit our 40th episode uh, recently. Uh, we also have a shorter strand called My Brilliant Moment where we do three minute TED Talk style programs and we've filmed over 300 of those in the last couple of years. And this is really giving profile to very small organizations that just will not break through um, at the national level don't really know how to talk to their local TV or local radio outlets uh, and is really skilling them up and, and giving them uh, an outlet and, and a way to kind of celebrate their work. We also run partnerships with some of our media partners. So uh, this was a six-week competition we ran with the Sunday Times um, a year ago looking for the UK's Social Innovator of the Year, which was won by a postman in Jersey who uh, has a click and uh, care service where the postman just look, look into people who don't have anyone looking after them. Uh, and we run various uh, programs like this. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned so far is the pro bono support that the media industry offer us. So we are a very small channel uh, and we can't really afford to have um, the broadcast coverage we would like. So we get um, discounted airspace and free airspace, free content support and free marketing support from a whole load of um, media organizations in the UK uh, to the tunes of millions of dollars each year. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be able to broadcast. Um, so we also run some initiatives within the channel. This is London 360, which is our youth journalism strand. So we provide a five-month internship where we train uh, a small cadre of in-house journalists who otherwise would not have access to the media industry uh, in all types of journalism skills uh, for all types of platforms. So from broadcast to print to online to radio um, and everything ranging from um, technical production skills through to editorial through to personal branding, social media uh, and public speaking. This is the Series 10 crew who are filming at the moment um, and they're with us for the next five months. Um, and at the end of the five months, they will have worked with us. They create a TV show that goes out fortnightly, um, which is broadcast on Community Channel plus the local London channel. They work with BBC Radio London, they work with the Huffington Post, the London newspapers uh, and various other part, a couple of local radios as well, the radio stations as well. We get 80% of our in-house in, um, uh, journalists go into employment in the industry going to work for the BBC and Sky. Um, and other media outlets, and, we, and they go in at kind of second job level, so uh, they don't go in um, as trainees or, or assistants, they go in as um, junior producers or presenters and things like that. Uh, very successful um, model, but um, an, ongoing, um, an ongoing effort to keep it funded year after year because it's quite, quite expensive to run. Um, this is something new we're doing, which is training 30 young people who are not in employment educational training, so much harder um, to reach, you know, um, some of our, our needs have got behavioral issues, learning difficulties, Asperger's, autism, histories of abuse. Uh, and this is a six week 
six week intense masterclass program with six weeks of mentoring and again placing them uh, into work. Charlie on the right here um, wrote a Facebook post um, about how she was dumped by her modeling agency for being too heavy, would you believe it, uh, which was then picked up by The Guardian, Channel 4, BBC and a whole load of outlets and we kind of shepherded her around as the national um, press, national outlets uh, took her story on. Uh, we've had some great success in um, getting jobs for some of these young people. We recently had an event at the Mayor of London's um, City Hall where Jodie, who's, who's in this, spoke. She's got learning dis difficulties and is now working for L'Oreal on an assisted internship and is dealing with their various spokes models and presenters. Um, she can, it's completely turned her life around um, and she's um, really come out of her shell. Um, Going back to our kind of work with um, Trust and Foundations, in February we ran a major food season working with a, a large independent funder called the Esme Fairburn Foundation. Uh, and to do this, we, we have this model of bringing together um, NGOs, non-profits, uh, into the channel to create advisory groups so they can tell us the topics that need to be showcased. We, we, we essentially say, we're here, we've got the tools, we've got production resources, we've got partnerships, but you tell us the, fo you know, the, the issues to focus on. So we brought together um, major organizations right through to very, very small local scale organizations working in um, you know, everywhere from Brighton on the south coast of England up to, to Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, and they all said things like, we need to focus on conservation, we need to get people eating less meat, we need to promote grains, we need to reduce food waste, we need to lobby government so they listen to us and they're not only listening to uh, corporate interests. Uh, and the uptake, getting 35 people in the room, just indicated the, the kind of passion and appetite uh, to, to get their stories out there. And I've got a little bit of video that shows um, what we did with the season. Um, I don't know if that's ready to, to play at all. Yes? No? So for the season, we ended up bringing together 100 different programs, including eight series, some from the UK, some from the US. We filmed a six-part series ourselves. Um, and... I'll show you a little bit of it now. You get the Food idea. Food in this it. pan will shortly be feeding 5,000 people, and it's made entirely out of vegetables that would otherwise have gone to waste. Join us to celebrate those fighting to improve the way we eat, the people pioneering new ways to grow, share, and eat food. They are going to learn about how to eat healthy, where their food comes from, how to support the system in some way. Those who believe our food should be fresh, seasonal and local. It's all about fostering the happiness of three groups of people, the staff, the customers and the suppliers. If we can understand what makes those groups happy and feed them, then we're creating a great community store. Throughout February, we'll be supporting the sustainable, championing the ethical. For every pound you've done, creates four meals, you've made 40 dinners for fair share. And celebrating the real food revolution. Weeknights throughout February on Community Channel. This is Europe's largest soup pot, by the way. It can, it can feed 5,000 people. It takes a whole day to make food, but uh, there, there you go. Um, so we trained a whole load of organizations. We work with our media partners who provided us with content, with advertising space in national newspapers, on national TV channels. Uh, we created a website, did a whole load of PR stunts, got spokespeople into the press, um, and uh, overall it went pretty well. We then um, interviewed uh, our, we asked our audience to, to write in and tell us what difference it had made and they told us things like, I'm going to start using my leftovers more, I'm going to uh, join my local community farm, I'm going to try making cheese, you know. So, real difference on a very kind of personal and local level. Uh, one of our projects at the moment is all around celebrating community arts. So this is a series we're about to start filming, looking at participatory arts uh, across the UK. We're getting some comedians in to present it and we'll be filming a whole load of different uh, organisations. We're also training groups uh, in London, Birmingham and Newcastle uh, to skill them up uh, in, in media production. Um, and again, you know, it's shining a light on, on the organisations that are doing great work but would not be profiled anywhere else. And again, we have kind of eight different art organisations advising us on, on the great events going on, the kinds of topics they want profiled. And it's our job to turn the arts, which is really hard to get an audience uh, to come to, into something that is very relatable, guided by a presenter, uh, and very immersive. So we're, we're going uh, to run the series from the perspective of audience experience, from kind of sensory events through to spatial things, um, through to all sorts of uh, wild and wacky undiscovered arts. Um, we're also dabbling in a little bit of 360 video as well. Um, so we want to get, get some arts performance captured in a 360 VR kind of way, uh, largely for online. 
So that's kind of stuff we do. I thought I'd, I'd write, I've got only a few minutes left, so I'm going to run through a few uh, charts, and then I'll give a second helping of, of the impact side of things. So we asked a couple of hundred of the charities, you know, what difference does it make being on the channel? Uh, largely, it is about awareness and visibility. I think that's granted, and that's the kind of first thing. But then there's a, a large chunk of them who say, actually, it's improved our, our campaigns, it's made us work differently, and it's also increased support for us. And by organizational support, that is more donations coming in, more volunteers, and more engagement in the local uh, community. Uh, and then we ask our audience. So we've got about 1,000 of our survey response from our audience. You know, so what difference does the channel make in terms of uh, viewing? Well, this is kind of, it, this chart should be kind of flipped the other way around. I mean, we find there's kind of universal benefit because everybody learns something from watching the channel. Then a smaller amount of people have their opinions shifted and they talk to their friends about it. But then we have a sizable uh, amount of audience who are going out and volunteering and getting involved in their local community thanks, thanks to the channel. Um, through our data, we can also, you know, slice and dice, you know, where our viewers are, who they are, what they're watching. But one kind of interesting fact is, you know, about engagement, uh, and this kind of mirrors kind of volunteering in general, which is about um, the groups that get involved um, in a local community. And we see that the kind of peaks uh, in the younger audiences, you know, kind of teens through to college age, uh, and then slightly older audiences. So you can see the kind of dip in the kind of family raising age, perhaps, and then in slightly older audiences as well. Uh, and then we get some nice verbatim back, people saying it's a hidden gem, that needs more support, it's inspired people that they can do anything. So, a lovely story all around there. Now, I've got about three minutes left, so we do like a bit of impact, and, and the students who were over from Mizzou last summer heard this. This is my, my colleague, Impact Phil, who is our, our supremo on, on the impact side. So, what do we mean? So, it's really about, you know, understanding the resources we've got, what we're doing, how that turns into our outputs, and then the, out, the outcomes of that. And then it's by gauging the, kind of the outcomes, the, the, the impact we have on, on the nonprofits, the charities, our audiences, our media partners, um, that we can gauge our impact. So for the food season, we did a very small, simple model. This, you know, we, we have other projects where we have external evaluators and massive frameworks and all this kind of stuff. But for this, very straightforward, we just wanted to demonstrate that we've skilled up some nonprofits, we've filmed them and got their stories out there, and for the public, we've kind of increased their knowledge, influenced them, uh, and made them um, engage and, and change their behaviors. And so we have a, a number of different tactics we're, we're doing to work that through. Um, and that all plays into, into what is called the theory of change. So every uh, nonprofit should have a theory of change framework, and this is, this is how you create behavior change. So you look at the behavior you're trying to affect, and how you can do that through uh, shifting personal attitudes, um, there's, there's a huge amount of kind of peer reinforcement that, that plays into that. People are very unlikely to, to change their behaviors and attitudes in isolation. They need kind of external validation to do that. And you also need kind of personal efficacy and personal, um, oh, what is it? personal agency to, to do that. Uh, and once you have all those three things in place, you can then start tracking the, the effect on the individual. Why did we think that a food season would work in particular? Well, through our, our content surveys that we put out, we ask our viewers, you know, what, what, what is it you like about the channel? And they say, well, you show content that you don't see anywhere else, that other broadcasters wouldn't pick up, you hear kind of distinct voices. Um, and the things that motivate them to get involved are around our, uh, our non-profit stories. Um, we show a lot of kind of entertainment series, but people don't really engage with those. We show a lot of global documentaries, which, People like, and they get a lot of viewing, but they're really remote, and people don't know how to engage with, you know, um, stopping social injustice in India. You know, how do I do that if I'm sat in a bedsit in Bognor, you know? Um, so they really like the fact that we run community stories and run campaigns and seasons, and the season model helps bring it all together. So that's, that's uh, this is how we're going to measure our success uh, on this uh, season. So, you know, through questionnaires, through case studies, through focus groups, through the data we're collecting, both through our audience panels. We have Barb, which is the equivalent of Nielsen. We have Google Analytics. We have other social media metrics. Uh, we had um, this Twitter TV um, tool where we can actually look at uh, synchronized Twitter activity around, around broadcast. And then we had, uh, interview our partners as well. And we go back to our funder and say, look, look at what we've done. Thanks to your investment, we've unlocked a whole load of media support. You've unlocked our time and our, our platforms, and we've made a real change. Um, and our, our funders are thrilled with it. So I'm going to run over. But this, this is just the, la the last thing, really, is this comes from uh, media psychology. Our head of development loves this model because it just shows how difficult it is to create behavior change in people um, through media. 
it's not just like a one-hit wonder. It takes time. It takes um, you, you need to be open to suggestion, and then you need to have it reinforced. So, this is the the pathway from uh, for the kind of first touch through to actually changing your behaviour. So, you know, you have to be open to the um, suggestion. You need to be motivated to pay attention. You need to have the time and the ability to engage with it. You need to change your opinions in the short term, but then you need to reinforce it again and again and again. And then that can provoke uh, a long-term change in attitude, and then you see behavior change. So it's a whittling process. It takes time. It's not, you can't, you know, it's the thing we need to communicate to the people we work with is, you know, having one article being posted is not going to have a fundamental change. Having one bit of video is not going to create fundamental change. But if you create the context and you reinforce it and reinforce it, then you start seeing change uh, in society. Um, and the UK government announced a couple of days ago that they are now introducing a sugar levy, a sugar tax on soft drinks, on, on pop and soda. And that has been two years of campaigning for one of the organisations we've worked with. They've wheeled out celebs. They've got a lot of press coverage, there's been TV series, um, and despite fierce opposition, the government are now bringing that in. So just to finish, to come back to Sylvia, one woman living in Manchester, um, so inspired by the channel, she now started volunteering, she felt that she could turn her life around, and so she volunteered with the local fire service, she did over 400 hours of volunteering, um, and she is now employed by them to uh, be a community safety advisor. She makes short films about disability, she volunteers at her local girl guiding Girl Scout troop, and she's planning biking for um, a local cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis research. So this is one example. We've got loads of examples of people. You know, the spark is out there, so you, know, you can see something, you can be inspired that people like you are making a change and can make a change, and that you can go out and change your life and improve your community through the power of media. So that's what we do. Uh, I hope you found that of interest. It's about collaboration across a whole load of different um, interested parties. Um, and thank you for having me. So before we break real quickly, and, and one of the reasons um, I, I had the good fortune of being in London last summer, and Alex hosted the Missouri School of Journalism contingency there uh, and did a, a, a terrific pro, uh, program for us. Um, can you talk a little bit about, for instance, um, a, a program where you train voices in the community to, uh, to, to frankly speak to the media about issues, particularly global issues, for instance, maybe the Syrian crisis and, and that kind of thing, yeah. so that people are, are, are more well informed with uh, someone who might be connected? Uh, yeah, I mean, some, some of the, the organizations we work with are kind of international NGO and human rights uh, organizations uh, ranging from the Open Society Foundations, which is uh, run by, uh, or funded by George Soros, uh, kind of a sister organization to Human Rights Watch. Um, and we also work with the Gates Foundation. Uh, so about a year ago, uh, well, I mean, on the, on the channel we've run seasons with um, the Gypsy and Roma communities who are kind of vilified in the press, uh, giving them the opportunity to present news and stories in a way that um, basically treats them as human beings rather than uh, as uh, being demonized. But um, our work from that led on to a, a pilot project we ran last year with the Open Society Foundation to train Somali groups um, in London and Leicester. Now, the Somali community kind of face a lot of issues and a, very, a lot of media hostility and are, in fact, very hostile to the media. Um, Somalia is a failed state. A lot of the people living in the UK have, have come, come over in a couple of different waves uh, of civil war and um, other political um, problems there. And they're largely represented in the media as um, uh, the, the, the topics are led by Somali piracy, uh, which you will know from the, the Tom Hanks movie. Uh, Captain Phillips, was it? Is that right? Was that the movie? Uh, um, there's piracy, there's the failed state, civil war, there's Al-Shabaab, which is a militant Islamic group, um, and also a lot of uh, social deprivation in the UK, a lot of kind of poverty and housing issues and health issues in the UK. Um, so we worked with um, around 30 um, leaders from across the Somali communities uh, of different ages, involved in different ways, some academics, some um, running lifestyle blogs, um, and essentially uh, partnered them up with BBC local radio uh, mentors to give them media interview training and media skills so they can get involved. Uh, and it culminated in a, um, in a round table uh, debate uh, in a room kind of this size uh, at BBC at New Broadcasting House, where we put together a panel of the editor of BBC Radio London, um, the S Sky News' community editor, so Sky News are kind of the equivalent of, um, say, Fox News uh, in the UK, but not quite as right wing, and um, The Guardian's community's editor as well as a couple of reps from the Somali community. And um, 
for some reason, I, I was asked to chair that, even though I'm not kind of hugely involved uh, and don't know a huge amount about the Somali community. And it was really very testy. You had the media saying, come and talk to us. We, we, you know, we don't discriminate by community, but in London there are 300 communities. If you want your voice heard, step up and, and get involved, uh, but we won't give you special treatment. Um, the Somali community basically saying, we're not going to engage with you because you don't, we don't trust you and you are... Uh, you demonise us, and we're not going to talk to Sky because you're like Fox, and we don't believe in murder outfits. But the the outcome of all of that is, despite the kind of mutual distrust and hostility, you know, um, there was a lot of um, walls broken down during that, uh, and um, we now see kind of continued engagement with some of the community leaders, uh, with the local media. There's more success in getting their stories out there. And then from this model, we've now expanded it um, into three cities um, with with more funding. So we're now training. Uh, 10 different local migrant communities in London, uh, from Somali through to, to Polish, through to Portuguese, through to other Middle Eastern uh, and African uh, communities. And the idea really is to make the media more representative and more accountable. Um, so that is one of, one of the initiatives we're working with um, different diverse diaspora voices. But um, the, a lot of the different um, initiatives we're involved in are about giving voice to those who do not have um, proper representation in the media. So we work with a lot of young people who are um, fairly disenfranchised from mainstream media and give them opportunities to, to get involved and get trained by news outlets, by YouTube, by Google, um, and various other, other organizations. Alex Khan from Media Trust Thank in you. the UK. Thank you. Thank you.